What do you know about Africa Day? We'll discuss the reason for Africa Day, the African Union. How strong and effective is it? Also, Sierra Leone's Education Minister David Moinina Senge is my guest this week. We'll talk about his new book and how he helped his country make a U-turn on pregnant girls in the classroom. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams. Thursday, May 25th is Africa Day. It's meant to commemorate the founding of the Organization of African Unity in 1963. The, today, the OAU is known as the African Union. And this year's Africa Day marks the 60th anniversary celebration of the OAU's establishment. But how much do people across the continent really know about the African Union? or about Africa Day. We spoke to people on the streets of Nairobi, Kenya and Abuja, Nigeria and Accra, Ghana to find out. Never. Uh, this is going to be my first day to hear about it. I've not been aware of that there is a day like Africa Day. But uh, as you put it rightly, the day is there. We should start by grassroots sensitization to create awareness that this day exists. So once it gains relevance, it is easier now to tell people to celebrate it. The only culture holding the whole world together is from Africa. When you talk of culture in diversity, it is Africa. We've not made progress. We aren't even united. There's, there's injustice everywhere. No love. So I don't think uh, it was it. Nothing. Africa has not gotten anything. African Day is a day where Africans come together to, to celebrate and to remember the history of Africans who were once slaves to the Western community. And I think and I believe that it's a day that we understand and celebrate our history and our culture. When we say African Day, we're talking about the identity of the African and the total emancipation of the African continent. We're talking about the economic wise, you know, the social upliftment and the political and geopolitical emancipation of the African continent. Well, joining me now to discuss and analyze the strength and effectiveness of this union between 55 African countries, the African Union and Africa Day is David Monde. He's a professor of political science at City University of New York, and he joins me via Skype from New York City. Prof, always great to see you, always great to have you on the show. Um, we had some answers there from uh, folks on the streets in different cities. Um, some knew what Africa Day was about. Some did not? Are you surprised by the mixed reaction? No, I'm actually not. Uh, and uh, simply because uh, six years after the formation of the Organization of African Unity and its um, evolution into the African Union, Africans really still don't see their continent as one. Uh, the continent is still very uh, divided in terms of the different nation states and their own particular interests. But I think if Africa Day is really to become encapsulated in the lives of, of Africans, it really needs to be made real. So, for example, Nigerians should easily be able to go to Burkina Faso or Egypt or Kenya or South Africa and work and vice versa. There has to be an inter-African um, inter cooperation to make movement of people, goods and services a lot easier so that individuals in all countries can feel that they can travel, interact, and engage across the continent. And I think that's still a challenge. And a Professor, is part of the challenge also that there just simply are so many countries part of this union, countries with different trajectories, countries with different histories, different languages, cultures. We always talk about how diverse our continent is. Um, is that part of the greater challenge to, to form a union that is almost 
I guess, perfect amongst all these different countries with different interests? Yes, I think that's a, that's a major uh, challenge. But also in addition to what you've mentioned is uh, the framework into how we've adopted, we, we've uh, tried to bring these countries together. The, um, the African heads of government and states uh, meeting is really uh, the pinnacle of uh, the basis in terms of which how the, the African Union is moved forward. But that really doesn't translate to subnational governments and people on the ground. So uh, a lot of Africans really see this meet annual meetings in Addis Ababa as talk shops, but it's really not made real on the ground. And I think that's one of the bigger challenges. How do we uh, integrate from different regions, from the East countries in the West, Eastern blocks, Western blocks, the Northern blocks, Central and Southern block? To, to make it more real to people rather than having, um, you know, heads of states meetings at high levels. But in conclusion, I'd also add the other thing that we really need to be thinking about is in terms of the opportunities and diversities of, of the countries. How do we remove non-tariff barriers? For example, uh, education qualifications of someone from Ivory Coast for them to be able to work in Uganda or Egypt. Right. Some of those uh, mm -hmm. traditional linguistic, normative and customary barriers are still in force. And I think that's something we need to think about. So moving it away from the diplomats and the presidents at the high level to local levels and local interoperability between countries, I think, is, is, is one of the steps uh, to take Africa, the Africa Union and Africa Day ahead. And uh, Professor, I want to ask you about the African Union itself and, and how it comes across perhaps to ordinary people, especially in terms of its programs and initiatives. I remember many years ago in South Africa when Thabo Mbeki was still president, there was a lot of talk around NEPAD, for example. But how does the, the African Union work? I mean, it does seem obscure at times. What is this union meant to accomplish for ordinary people on the continent? So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very broad question, and I'll answer it in this way. It's really supposed to uh, make Africa real to Africans on the ground. So in terms of the economy, in terms of the politics, in terms of the economics, and also in terms of the culture and tradition. And if I may uh, very quickly talk specifically, uh, for example, about the economics. How, uh, for example, do we um, afford all the different fractured uh, airlines on the continent to work as one. A very uh, interesting uh, development was this cooperation thing between Kenya Airways and South African Airways to try and pool their resources uh, together uh, to, to expand this very small African market so that instead of every country having its own airline, how can we pool our resources together and cooperate and actually move forward on some of those African Union agreements for example, around the Yamasukra Accord. How do we make these uh, institutions real to the people on the ground? Air travel will be a big one. In terms of the politics, the African uh, peer review mechanism, there needs to be made, to, to, uh, it needs to be done and implemented accordingly. But I think the last aspect also, in addition to the economics and the structural and political issues, is funding issues for the African Union, African states, most of them have not paid their dues to the African Union. They are way back uh, in arrears on their dues. And if we're really going to be serious about integrating the continent, uh, African states really need to fund the African Union themselves so that peace missions, economic integration, a lot of the nuts and bolts issues to make it real to people on the ground can be funded. A lot of the funding for African Union right now comes externally, mainly from the uh, European Union and, and the United States. I think that's something very important we need to think about. Funding, diplomatic integration, and also economic integration on things like airlines. Um, and the airline issue is really something that, that's tangible, that people do actually see happen. I always wonder how many people really know that the AU actually played an important role in that happening. But I want to talk to you about the effectiveness of this institution as a pan-African institution. How much teeth does it really have? I mean, we've seen some successes in, in recent months, or a success um, to speak of, and that was, of course, um, 
with the conflict in Ethiopia, where we had the government, um, of course, come and sign a peace agreement with the TPLF. Um, but right now, Sudan is happening. How engaged is the African Union there? Why are the, the mediation talks um, surrounding Sudan, which is on the doorstep of the African Union, why are those being held in the Middle East? Yes, yeah, so this is a, the, the exact question um, to, 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 to what you have raised. The African Union really has no teeth in, in many instances. If we specifically talk about the case of Sudan, uh, the country is burning, yet uh, the interventions uh, really seem to be, do, be, be happening in Jeddah, outside of the continent. The regional leaders through IGAD have offered to mediate, but that hasn't been taken up. So when we think about mediation, for example, to the specific case you've talked about in Sudan, diplomacy really needs to be backed up by the coercive threat of hard power, meaning force. And uh, the African Union doesn't have a robust military force that can intervene and engage on some of these conflicts. And I think the solution to that, again, will be moving the functions of the union away from the heads of state meeting, where presidents have tended to um, hold on to the powers at the apex, at the executive level, and really bring it down to, say, the African parliamentary uh, meeting setting, which is headquartered in South Africa for that matter, to really break down some of these issues and have an African legislature that can really deal with some of these nuts and bolts issues, because that is a huge, huge problem. Africa has problems intervening regionally and actually sustaining intervention. But I may add, there's also been success on that front. We think about ECOWAS and ECOMOG in Liberia and in Sierra Leone. We have the East African Defense Force now in, in the DRC, uh, supplemented by, by SADAC. I think those are positive inter, uh, interventions. But I think also in terms of how do we integrate some of these regional interventions, say the East African Defense Force in the DRC and SADAC to actually promote peace and stability. So moving it away from the executives, from the heads of state and government meeting at the AU and really bringing it down to real legislative forums that can actually have impact on the ground and have intervention in some of these crisis points like Sudan. Uh, Professor, I want to very briefly turn to an op-ed you wrote in Kenya's um, Star newspaper entitled, For Africans, Ukraine War is a European Problem. And you say Africa has more pressing priorities than worrying about wars in Europe, um, especially when Europe has shown scant interest in African wars. Um, I want to ask you about that. Um, you know, African problems, African solutions, European problems, European solutions, but we do live in an interconnected world. And was one of the reasons why the war in Ukraine did impact Africa, not because, um, you know, there were African countries who were reliant on grain and other agricultural imports from Ukraine and from Russia, and therefore that had an impact. How do you um, weigh up all, all of these and then say, you know, Africa should not have to be in the middle of what goes on in, in Europe and vice versa. Sure. So, so the ethos of, of, of that piece in, in the Star, um, Heidi, was not not to say that we live in uh, in in an isolated world that we should silo African problems and European problems. But I think the gist of that piece was to say, uh, courtesy begins at home. Your house can't be burning, and uh, you're going to t turn off the flame in your neighbor's, uh, you know, in your neighbor's house. You really need to take care of massive problems that are engulfing your region or your house before you worry about uh, the flames in other people's houses. If your house is burning, it's, it's, it's uh, illogical to take, you know, put out the, the, the flame in, in your neighbor's house. Europeans as a region have very much more robust systems to take care of problems in Ukraine and in the European region. But Africa, we haven't really consolidated and developed our mechanisms to take care of our problems. And the case of Sudan that you mentioned is, is a perfect case. The problems, perennial problems we've had in the DRC, uh, you know, is another case. Somalia is another case. I mean, there's a whole hodgepodge of challenges we have. Africa really needs to seriously start reconsidering its priorities. Our priorities should be taking care of our people and their interests first our problems mm. before we worry about other continents that are 
uh, far more developed and have mecha their own mechanisms to take care of their problems um, that are much stronger than ours. Well, Professor, it reminds me of a saying in South Africa, pretty much along the lines of what you just said, sweep in front of your own door first before you go sweeping somewhere else. Um, but, but thank you so much, Professor David Monda, for a political science professor at City University of New York. Professor, thank you. Always great to have you. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you so much for having me. Stay here with Straight Talk Africa after the break. When President Bill himself publicly said pregnant girls could not go to school. And I was in the audience and I was like, what, how? I'm going to be the one who's going to be doing this. Session with Sierra Leone's education minister about his new book and how he persuaded the president to make a U-turn on pregnant girls in school. Stay with us. We're back in a moment. Welcome back. My special guest this week is Sierra Leone's Education Minister, David Moinina Senge. His country's decision to lift a decade-old ban on allowing pregnant girls in school did not come easy. It required someone to have the courage to speak up, speak out, and persuade the president to change his views and his policies. That's how Senge played an instrumental role in Sierra Leone's shift to include pregnant girls in the classroom and give them an equal chance to succeed. Now he's written a book about that experience. It's part parable, part practical guide to changing the systems that perpetuate exclusion in everyday life. And like all roadmaps, David Senge's begins at home. Now, you are Sierra Leone's basic education minister, which means, of course, you oversee the country's public schools. You are the country's chief innovation officer. You're a recording artist, a clothing designer, an inventor, and, of course, an author. We'll talk about your book a little later on. Uh, how would you describe yourself, given all these many hats that you wear or have worn? I will describe myself as somebody who wants to make the world better. I like to work on things that bring other people in. Um, I grew up with my parents having 20, 30, and at some point during the war, 50, 60 people who live in our house. Um, what I grew up considering as brother and sister was beyond who was just my biological siblings. But you, you have all of these people who your parents are taking care of, who you're living and growing up together with. But I also like to play. I play a lot, whether it's football or the guitar or um, just working with some people to design new clothes or coming up with new rap lyrics. And um, for me, that collaboration really is a driver uh, for what I do um, and what I enjoy. So I think it's the, it's the play and freedom to play and create. But ultimately, it's working on things that bring other people along. And um, inclusion has been central to what I do. You mentioned war. From what you saw as a child growing up in your country, how did that shape and change you? You know, I remember very vividly a very specific example where we were running. Um, our, our community had been attacked and we were going someplace and I saw children. There were children who were um, child soldiers and, and um, I remember being interrogated by them, or my parents being interrogated by them, and actively thinking that I will want to work for a Sierra Leone where my children or where no other child has to do what these kids were doing. Um, that stayed with me. Um, and later on, when I was a teenager, I saw people who were amputees and victims, and I had a conversation with them. And I remember knowing that they did not use their prosthesis because it was uncomfortable, even though it was free. And that shaped my desire to want to work on prosthetics and do something that was better for them uh, such that they could be good citizens and contribute back into society. So my background, 
definitely worshipped by that. But I do think my home, my community, as you said, um, my parents, uh, the people in my neighborhood, my friends, definitely shaped who I ended up becoming. Um, and this continues to grow. Um, and it's important that people realize that we are not just ourselves. We don't just come out of nothing, out of thin air. But rather, we come from the communities that we are part of. I think the one moment that struck me, that as I'm sure struck many people, was of course you and President Julius Madabio making this announcement that you were lifting the ban on pregnant girls in school. Tell us why you decided to tackle that issue. What were you seeing that perhaps others were not seeing? President Bill ran on a campaign to bring free quality school education. And then, as you mentioned, I'm responsible for all schools from pre-primary all the way through senior secondary education. And so it mattered for him that everybody could access and stay in school. And then when we came, there was this big epidemic about rape and, and mm -hmm. child and right. teenage pregnancy. And he had an emergency, he declared an emergency on rape and began to fix that. And then there were issues around sanitary hygiene and the first lady was working on that and the president became a champion for this as well. So when the ban on pregnant girls, when President Bill himself publicly said pregnant girls could not go to school, he was going to continue a 10-year-old ban. So he didn't start the ban, he was there, 10 years old. But he publicly said on the day that I became minister, coincidentally, that you know, we're going to continue this. And I was in the audience and I was like, what, how? I'm going to be the one who's going to be doing this. And um, we had a conversation and he gave me an in. He said, if you find me pregnant girls who you talk to and learn from them, I'll be willing to listen. That gave me hope. And over the years, we ended up, over the months, not years, we ended up um, engaging people, parents, teachers, and everybody. And it was based on a fundamental principle that the president and I agreed on. So we started on different parts. And what we based our final answer on was that you cannot victimize a victim already. Many of these girls who we are working to bring to school, who we are fighting and giving them justice through this um, declaration of emergency on rape, are rape victims. Because when you're under 18, you're not giving consent. There's no informed consent. And so these girls, majority of whom were pregnant, were rape victims. And we cannot then look at the rape victims and say, we're going to punish you because you were raped um, and keep you out of school. That was the fundamental um, line with which we converged on. And everything else, getting society and the systems, um, was around how we get them to see where we had arrived at to make sure that these girls can come back to school. This radical move brings me to your book entitled Radical Inclusion, Seven Steps to Help You Create a More Just Workplace, Home and World. And this book starts out with changing this policy. Why did you decide then that this should be a book? It ultimately is a book that I use regularly in my line of work. Um, I, after going through these steps, these seven steps that I present in the book, I found myself coming back to it repeatedly. When we wanted to have a corporal punishment policy, I used the same policies and frameworks. When I want to do anything, whether I was with innovation or um, in life at home, I found myself using the same ideas of how do you get people to understand about what exclusion exists and how do you get them to take committed action to change that? And so I wrote it because I do use it, um, but I, I realize that as policymakers, we often don't have a framework with which we can implement our work, and we need it, because people come as policymakers, whether they are ministers or heads of organizations, and we assume that they must know ways in which they can bring transformational change and leadership, but that's not obvious. And I hope that um, this book does address some of that. But your point about radical, it really is that um, you need leadership, radical leadership and an authorizing environment. And I was lucky that President Bill himself gave me that hope. Because there's nothing more radical than a president going publicly to say 
I believe A, and then later on saying, well, actually, A, I, now I've learned something else, um, and I think A is wrong. One thing you just mentioned is that often people don't realize what exclusion really is or looks like. Talk to us a little bit about why people don't necessarily know what exclusion looks like. Can you give us some ideas of, of what everyday exclusions might look and feel like? I think we assume that exclusion largely is not about us. There are other people and that we are not the ones doing the exclusion. But then when we pause to just reflect for a second, there are many things that we do every day that exclude other people. And um, people don't like to face that reality. But so in very obvious and clear ways, people who have disabilities are, are largely excluded. And this, it, it doesn't matter how powerful you are. And I do reference the Queen of England, um, yes. well-known figure, liked by many. Uh, in her final year, her brain was still very cogent. And her state opening of parliament in the UK she couldn't give it. Instead, the British people took her crown and put her crown on the stool and had her son give the speech. Why? Because of mobility issues. Because um, many people suggested that it was because she would be in a wheelchair. Sadly, we live in a world where people think when people have disabilities, they cannot be them, their full selves in that way. And the thing is, you don't have to be in a wheelchair permanently to understand that the built world often excludes people with disabilities. And the only thing, you go running, you're a great person, physical, healthy, you sprain your leg and it's in a brace, Sorry. and then suddenly you begin to say, this crutch is terrible. I can't even go this up the stairs of my office. It's so Who designed true. this. Yes. And until we realize that when we think about exclusion, it's not about other people. We can all be affected by exclusion, some more than others, some more frequently than others. Women largely around the world, um, certainly in this country, in, 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 in Africa, are often excluded. People of color are often excluded, minority groups. But any one of us could be at any point in time. Of course, you are Sierra Leone's youngest cabinet minister. I'm sure you're, a lot of young people look at you and, and they see the future. But I remember someone telling me something once. It's not your age, but it's, it's how young your ideas are. Tell me about your ideas. What is your teaching philosophy? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. I do think it's, we have to be able to change and learn a lot. This is really important, that we are not just stuck, that we can be 90, 98, and still be learning something new. We can be experienced in our job, but be open to seeing a different perspective that might transform us. And I think this is something that I carry uh, in everything I do. I interact with President Bill in the same way I interact with his daughter or my daughter or the kid I met up north in rural areas. I'm always available to, to engage. I could go up north on a school visit and in the evening I want to play football. I join a local football team that's a bunch of students who are in school and for me my mind is I just want to play the ball like pass run chase <laughs> the ball and these kids maybe are thinking crazy that they're playing football with the minister maybe they don't want to tackle right. the minister no, that's too cool much to be you know? able to play with the minister but um, this is all wonderful to see it is wonderful to learn about and I want to say to you congratulations radical inclusion seven steps to help you create a more just workplace home and world this is a book by Sierra Leone's Minister of Basic Education David Moinina Senge Minister Senge Thank you for coming here and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. This has been a real pleasure. And that is where we will leave it for this week. And you can find all the latest news and developments from across the African continent on voaafrica.com. And do remember to follow Straight Talk Africa on social media. A big thank you to all our affiliate news stations and, of course, to you, our audience, for joining us on TV, radio and online. Thank you for always watching and always listening. Do go well. Goodbye.